Welcome to this third and last talk on the wisdom of uncertainty, getting into the cloud of unknowing. And uh, these, this talk will conclude the series by looking at how we deal with thoughts during the time of prayer. At this time of uncertainty in the world, there are many theories about um, uh, what's the cause of the problems and what's going to happen. And really, we still don't know what's going to happen and we don't really know why things have become so difficult. So uh, it's learning to live with uncertainty, which is a great wisdom for today. And the cloud of unknowing uh, in these last chapters gives us advice on how to deal with the thoughts and the worries which get in the way of just living in the present moment, living with trust that things will be well and that uh, uh, and and the hope that um that even a better world may come out of the the situation of difficulty we're in so I'll share the pictures now. Uh, so as you, as you remember, this cloud of unknowing comes between us and, uh, and any ideas or images we may have about God. It's learning to enter into the, the experience of God, but without uh, um, set thoughts or images. It's a an invitation to what they call contemplative prayer. In the, um, this is the third talk where I look at chapters seven and nine. And these deal specifically with, with this issue of th thoughts. Uh, remember this cartoon, in here meditating all the time. Why do you have to be so thoughtless? That, <laughs> that we, we learned in the last talk that the um, contemplative doesn't cease to act in the world, but they, have to let go of the sense of being uh, the doer. So the letting go of, of thoughts is really letting go of thoughts about ourselves as being uh, the, the center of everything. And uh, from the last talk, you also remember that this, the contemplative is in a, in a sense between two clouds. There's the cloud of unknowing above them, between them and God, so that they cannot know God uh, and there's a cloud of forgetting beneath them and between them and all created things uh, that's all the other day-to-day -day thoughts and we have to uh, at least during the time of prayer let go of all these other uh, concerns and then outside the time of prayer we will be less anxious about them because we'll, we'll, not, we'll just do what we need to do without um, uh, thinking that we are the doer so this uh, sense of the contemplative being between two clouds is what makes contemplation difficult because they, um, uh, you can't think either about uh, the worldly concerns of the moment or, the, or about God. We have to let go of all thoughts. And chapter seven is about how a person should conduct themselves during prayer with regard to all thoughts. You remember, he's writing for a young man at the age 24, someone who's probably just come from university. Uh, the cloud also, although he's writing in Middle English, uh, which is the, the, not the university language of the time, uh, he's using terms which would have been uh, familiar with the, um, someone from that education. And he points out that this, this education is not going to help with the, with the contemplative life and that one of the biggest distractions is learning to let go of the curiosity and natural intelligence that is trained in the university. The medieval university was based around dis disputations, which were arguments about theological or scientific points. And uh, the, um, this whole form of learning uh, has its place but doesn't actually help with contemplation. In fact, it can get in the way. And the cloud also says that it's often those who have, uh, haven't had this education that can understand uh, the contemplative life much better, the simplicity of it. So especially, he says, especially thoughts arising 
from this curiosity and natural intelligence trained in the university, we have to uh, learn to let go of those. Uh, here you see two monks who've been through the rather uh, complex education system and, and they complicate the simplicity of it. Uh, one of them saying to the other, are you not thinking what I'm not thinking? <laughs> it's as if uh, not thinking itself is, is uh, something you can uh, think about. Uh, but actually not thinking is not something you can think about. And this is the, the cloud author is encouraging us to get into the cloud of unknowing, not just to, to think about not knowing. He says that it's natural for the mind to be busy. He says it's inevitable that ideas will arise in your mind and try to distract you in a thousand ways. The mind is naturally busy if it's not thinking about uh, things. It, it's, it abhors a vacuum. It doesn't like to be empty. So that um, these, mind, these thoughts will come. And I think this is important to recognize that, that uh, contemplative prayer is uh, not easy because it's not easy for us to, to let go of thoughts. The, the Indian tradition speaks of the monkey mind. The mind is like a tree with monkeys jumping uh, from branch to branch. And um, you never know, quite know which way they're going to jump next. They're unpredictable. And the mind is a bit like that. It's never still and will jump in all directions in order to keep busy. Uh, so it's, the child also says it's inevitable that this will happen. And when we sit for meditation or uh, enter into cont contemplative uh, prayer, the mind will immediately ask a question us saying, uh, what are you looking for? What do you want? This is the, um, the kind of uh, analysis which we're, you're trained in, in the university to, uh, to analyze what's the, uh, the meaning of everything. And so the mind will ask, well, what's the, what is the meaning of, of contemplation? What are you looking for? What do you want? And it, so you start, it starts trying to encourage um, reflection on meditation rather than entering into it. And the cloud author says, um, to all of these thoughts, you must reply, God alone I seek and desire, only God. So is this uh, answering all your thoughts with this, the simplicity of seeking, seeking God. And then if the thoughts they, uh, if, the, if they then ask, which they will if you, been, if you have a sort of theological orientation of the mind, they'll ask, then ask, well, who is this God? Who is this God that you're seeking for? But then you ask, the cloud also says, say to your thoughts, you are powerless to grasp him, be still. But this God we're seeking for uh, cannot be understood and we have to uh, be still to know God. It's in the stillness that we know God, not through uh, understanding. So this stillness uh, here symbolized by the candle, um, that a candle is a still flame, unless there's a, a breeze or uh, a draft in the room, and then the, the, the flame will flicker. And it's a bit like that in the mind. The mind uh, is a still flame reaching out like a candle flame up towards God. It's only when the, the mind flickers and, and waves with the um, drafts of thoughts that uh, this upward movement uh, ceases to happen. And so find, uh, if we look at a candle, we can see how it, it can inspire us towards prayer. It has that sort of stillness in it and this upward, uh, reaching upward and the, in uh, so a candle is, is a good focus for prayer. Uh, the artist I'm going to look at in this talk, I've chosen different artists for the others. The, um, the cloudscapes of, and the water lilies of the first talk and then the Renaissance paintings 
in a second, but in this we're looking at some modern art, uh, abstract art. Uh, abstract art has the um, intention of not giving us something, an image, or not giving us a subject to think about. So uh, in the first talk we had the clouds or the water lilies of Elf um, Monet, uh, and they don't necessarily give you something to think about, but they give you uh, a sensation, an image, and in the Renaissance art, they're normally depicting um, a subject, so we, we reflect also on the subject. But in abstract art, both of those are taken away, and uh, we're left with um, a very um, simple experience. I've chosen this artist, Mark Rothko, who's an American Jewish artist in the 20th century, and uh, he just did these, these canvases with shades of color. In this canvas here, you can't see the shades of color very much because <laughs> some of them are very subtle. Uh, and the writing on it is something I've added. He never wrote on the canvas, canvases. But anyway, he says, in, and this is what the quotation I've put, uh, the people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience as I had when I painted them. We are today cluttered with images and only abstract art can bring us to the threshold of the divine. So he was trying to draw people into a religious experience through these pictures with no images. And the removing of the images was what was going to bring uh, those, those contemplating to the threshold of the divine. So in some ways this Rothko's idea fits with the cloud of unknowing and people do meditate in front of these um, paintings as you see here. Some of Rothko's paintings are shades of light and dark, a bit like the clouds of Constable, but without the form, just the, the colours. Um, and he didn't give titles so that these um, paintings are normally called untitled. Uh, or sometimes just shade, uh, name, the name of the color. So there's nothing actually to think about, no title, subject, no image. If you enter into the, um, uh, the experience of, the, of what the, the painting is evoking, shades of light and darkness, like uh, again, like Constable's clouds, uh, but again, but now in, the, in an abstract form. This imagery of light and darkness is very uh, prevalent in the, in the writing of the, the author of The Cloud of Unknowing because he speaks of entering the darkness, but he also speaks of a luminous darkness, it's light in the darkness. The, uh, the, the cloud of unknowing is in a sense of dark, but it's, it's radiant with the light of God. Some of Mark Rothko's paintings, many of the early ones, are in colour. Uh, the colour uh, also expresses the, the sense of the numinous, the sort of presence uh, through the, 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 the paintings. This experience of standing before art without thinking is what the Rothko was trying to re restore to the appreciation of art. These are the paintings in the Tate Britain, uh, I mean Tate Modern in, in uh, London. Uh, which have this sort of mono, mono, monolithic character, a bit like Stonehenge. They're very uh, huge, sort of, uh, and they have this sort of um, numin numinous quality. It's a very still room to go into, and people sit there. And uh, before he died, he built a chapel in Houston, Texas, US, uh, the Roscoe Chapel, 
well, he put these rather somber, and he was a bit of a somber man, uh, pictures uh, as his sort of last expression of the, what he felt the religious experience could be uh, evoked by. And these are, in this picture, you can't see, the, the, they are delicate shades of dark uh, light. Uh, there's, but the, to enter into this experience of darkness and finding God there, God is in the darkness, uh, is what Mark Rothko was trying to express in this. And people do meditate here and find a, a great peace in these paintings. Now, coming back to the cloud of unknowing. Um, so in uh, chapter nine, my cloud author is giving, uh, coming back to this idea that we reach out to God, we let go of thoughts, but we're reaching out to God in love. Now, he says this has to be a naked intent unto God or a blind stirring of love. And that is, we don't clothe our uh, love of God with um, images or with wanting things. We have to reach out to God without uh, uh, these um, objects of clothing God in this way. He uses this term naked and blind, a bit like the Rothko paintings. They're very uh, sort of simple without ornamentation. But the cloud author says this is a, the direction of love because the energy it takes to create uh, all these thoughts can then be redirected towards uh, the heart, where we can reach out to God with the heart. And then here he says, if you want to have this intention, this reaching out to God, wrapped and enfolded in one word, if you want, you can take this uh, a bit like a letter, and put it in an envelope so that it, it, you can send it to God. And this one word is what expresses uh, this intention. And so it says, in this way, you can hold on to it, hold on to it better. So it's hard to keep uh, just this naked intention toward God unless you express it. And the best way to express it is in just one word. Take, he says, take a short word of one syllable. And he recommends the word love. The love expression is in a way sums up what you're doing so just one word is he recommends in prayer the word of this kind is god or the word love god being that which you're seeking and love being the way we seek so it can sum up this intention And he says, fasten this word to your heart, come what may. So the word becomes a way of keeping this connection uh, and this orientation of the will uh, in place. So um, in, during the time of meditation, we may use a prayer word to keep us focused, but also this prayer word carries with, is carried with us during the day and the other things that we do. The word is, in a sense, fastened to the heart. It's always there. And it can lead us, the moment we come back to the word, it leads us directly back to the heart. Uh, here, here, he also gives another bit of advice on the word. It can seem a bit strange, but he says sometimes the single word help is the best prayer word. Um, the, there's a sense that we need God's help. We can sum it up in one word, help. Um, it's a bit like the, the, the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. There's this calling on the Lord, but there's also the sense that we need, uh, we need this help, we need mercy, we need uh, healing. And he get, the cloud author gives the image of someone in a house when there's a fire, someone on the second floor of a house. And he says that there's no point uh, analyzing or thinking about where the fire came from and how it happened uh, or even is calling out the window saying trying to explain what's happening you just call out the word help <laughs> and the, 
the, the strength of this one word gets people's attention, uh, which a long discourse wouldn't. And he said, uh, or you shout fire or something. Uh, and it says the same with God. The, the focus of one word can help us, can be a way of, in a sense, getting God's attention. It's, it's, it's waking up this connection between us and God. And what we're being uh, saved from, what the fire is, is our own, um, our own selfishness. The fire is, is um, and we can't get out of it by just trying to improve our character. We need to be, in a sense, lifted out. We have to be, the traditional terminology is saved, but there's a sense that we have to be, uh, have this self-centeredness removed. We can't do it ourselves. And this, um, the cloud author says, is the root of sin. So instead of looking at sin as sort of certain behaviors, that's all the, the surface. This is getting to the root of it. And um, we know that in weeding, if you just cut the leaves off the weeds, they just grow back again. And it's the same if we try and improve our characters. It's a bit of an endless task. But if we um, uh, allow uh, this contemplative work to dig out the roots uh, of the problem by calling on God, then, uh, then the roots try up and this selfishness at the heart is gradually removed and we become more loving. And this is, um, so the cloud author says that contemplation dries up the root of sin by opening up uh, us to the light of God in the same way as a weed wants the roots are are um, exposed to the sun, uh, they wither up and we can't survive. So these um, prayer words uh, are, um, all enable us to come to make this connection with God and to be closely united with God, not just through thinking about God but being uh, drawn into a oneness with God. Uh, he speaks of a, unit, a, spirit, a unity of spirit. And he says this is to be knit with God in spirit, like uh, someone knitting, knits together um, two streams of wool to make one uh, uh, blanket, so that we're knitted together with God in oneness of love and in accordance of will. So the knitting happens in love. Our, our love and God's are united, so we begin to love like God loves, and to to will what God wills. The word. So this is, in a sense, how the uh, the word helps us to get through the cloud of unknowing to God by uh, uniting us to God in love. But the word also helps to put down all other thoughts under a cloud of forgetting. Uh, so that um, whenever any other thoughts come up uh, with the word it just sort of gently uh, stops them taking over and basically we, we don't the word creates the space again uh, and this is um, in the tradition of Christian meditation they recommend the prayer word Maranatha Maranatha ancient Christian prayer and it contains this sense of calling on the name of the Lord uh, Maranatha means come Lord um, and so it's this reaching out but also the sense of needing help we we're praying uh, come Lord we're, we need God's help that has that aspect in it as well but mostly the, the advice on this the recommendation of this prayer word is because it, it's not in our language so it doesn't evoke thoughts and images it's more like a sound and, and a harmonic sound Ma ra na fa ma ra na fa that uh, harmonic sound uh, soothes the mind so that the um, other thoughts uh, are let go of the thoughts we, we forget the other thoughts and we reach out to god in longing and in with a sense of our own need as well so the cloud author says that what uh, the prayer word does uh, or helps us to do is to make this movement where 
the, the um, we bring uh, instead of our thoughts, we focus on the heart. Uh, the, the heart is what uh, we pray with, and um, we saw this in the last talk how the mind and the heart become integrated, but they're led by the heart. So um, the heart becomes the guide, the guiding uh, power in, in prayer. So one prayer word is often expresses what we're really longing for. So in this cartoon, the girl says, meditation is too hard. How do you keep one thought in your mind for this long? And the guy says, dinner, 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 dinner. But the, um, the, the longing of his heart is summed up in one word. And once the, uh, once you really want something, then all other thoughts are, are easily let go of in the same sense, in the sense that if you want your dinner, then you're not going to start thinking about other things. Of course, this isn't a contemplation. We've got to want God, and, uh, which is beyond our imagination, whereas dinner we can always imagine. Um, but anyway, it gives the idea that, that the prayer word is linked to, to this sense of longing and need. Yeah, that's the the root of the prayer. So we're not really praying by get, trying to get rid of thoughts. Uh, that's a rather arid way of coming at the contemplative experience and doesn't really work. Uh, we pray more by getting into the heart and knowing that what we really want and giving ourselves over to what we, we really want and what we really need. Uh, so it's a much more... Um, natural to us. Uh, so the stillness of the mind uh, doesn't come through trying to stop the mind, the stillness of the mind comes from being um, in love. So the cloud author says this word is like a, a sharp dart of longing love. In the same way as an arrow uh, needs to be sharp and focused on its point so that it pierces something. And so prayer has to be, we can have all our different prayers, our liturgies and our intercessions, etc. But they all come to a focus. And it's this focus of prayer which is what helps to pierce the cloud of unknowing and reach God. And this um, focus can, is summed up in the prayer word. The prayer word sums up all the other prayers and brings it to an, an intensity. Uh, of uh, God help, <laughs> I mean, a simple intensity which helps, uh, which is what gets us through to God, bring, makes us as, as uh, uh, one with God. So a short word pierces heaven, like an arrow which needs to be focused at its point. Now, uh, before I end, I'm just going to add a few uh, little bits from later chapters as I say there are many more chapters to, than the, the initial nine chapters we've been mainly focusing on um, but I'm bringing in a few little bits of advice that come in in later chapters on this theme of uh, dealing with thoughts and the prayer word. Chapter 39 and the cloud author links it to goodness. Another way of uh, understanding God is as goodness. When we intend and this is uh, intercessory prayer. The cloud also speaking about praying for others and praying for ourselves. This is part of prayer and it's part of the, the prayer where we say help uh, for others and for ourselves. Uh, we seek goodness. And, um, but he says that this, all this prayer can be summed up in one word. When we intend to pray for goodness, let all our thoughts and desire be contained in this one small word, God. God contains all goodness. Nothing else, no other words are needed. For God is the epitome of all goodness. So just by calling on uh, God in a simple way, we, uh, we get all the other things we're praying for. Jesus said, uh, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and then all other things will come as well. All goodness is contained there. This is in other bits of scripture. Uh, 
why it says God is good. Uh, the sense that uh, the, some, some, the cloud author has said that we can't know the essence of God. We can know how God acts, uh, uh, but we can't know what God is in God's self. That's beyond our understanding. But there's, there's a sense that in this way, we, we do come to the essence of God. Uh, God is, is, is never going to be anything other than, than, than good. Uh, so, um, and this is expressed in, in the Psalms and letter of Peter. And in the letter of John, it says, God is love. Sense that this is the very essence of God. In the, in the contemplative prayer, we go, we're diving into this, uh, this sort of essence of God. So, contemplative prayer is to be immersed in God's love, to be rooted and, and grounded in that love, uh, like this tree you know, is rooted in the love of God and becomes loving because of that. So the cloud author says in this chapter, immerse yourselves, yourself in the spiritual reality that these words, goodness, God or love, speak of. So, immerse, so the words help us to connect with the spiritual reality that they speak of. And yet uh, without precise ideas of God or any distinct feeling. So the word helps us to discover the essence without uh, looking at the um, attributes of God or trying to experience any, any particular emotion. Uh, we have to realize that love is, is beyond uh, emotions in the sense that it's, it's an orientation of the will. It's a choice, uh, a choice which is in a sense made already. Our hearts are made for God. So that if we know the heart, then the, the heart will orientate like a magnet uh, immediately towards God. We just have to be true to ourselves and then we, we find that we are connected to God. It's a, a choiceless choice. It's made already. And th this is why the, the tree is rooted in, in, in God's love. So that the tree uh, to flower will always have to have that rootedness. Um, to be immersed in love. Now the feelings of love are like uh, these little um, drops. Uh, this is our feelings of love. Um, but as we enter into contemplative prayer, we enter into the ground of love. And the, the cloud author says that these feelings themselves will seem to disappear. And then we enter into the very ground from which the feelings come. So, and this is why some mystics, and the cloud author doesn't go into it very much, uh, experience as they are immersed in love, in a sense, a, a dryness or being stripped of, of feeling. And this is part of the journey because it, we have to let go of the sense of my, uh, me being the lover. The God is the lover and God is uh, loving through us. And uh, sometimes we don't even feel it, but it is happening through us. Uh, the famous story recently of Mother Teresa, who lived love and yet said that during her prayer, she was dry, couldn't feel, feel anything. But the God was loving through her. The God is uh, the lover and we are being immersed like a drop our love is being immersed in the ocean of love. Now, just at the end, in chapter 42, 41 and 42, he gives three last uh, bits of advice on how to deal with thoughts. And um, these distractions, if they keep coming, uh, what gives three more bits of advice. One is to look over the shoulder of the thought. It's as if the thought is standing in front of you, demanding your attention. And as we've seen, thoughts with emotional aspects are the hardest to look beyond. They, they hold us. Um, but he says to, to look over the shoulder, to see beyond, and use the prayer word to fix our attention on something beyond. Um, prayer word helps us to, to um, unhook from any compulsive thought. 
tend to uh, see beyond it. He says, if that doesn't work as well, then there's another bit of advice. He says to give up, surrender your effort. And sometimes trying too much uh, to sort of bat the thoughts away, uh, it can actually reinforce the thoughts. So he says to recognize that we do not know how to pray. And that if we do that, and we bow down, in a sense, before the thought, and we just give, say, we can't, we don't know how to get beyond this, then God comes and takes the thought away. This is um, the, the sense that God is the one guiding the prayer, not us. It's part of that learning that. But if the thought then still continues, he says, uh, uh, don't get discouraged, uh, but put up with the thoughts. Uh, say, if you're saying your prayer word and the thoughts just keep coming, then don't get discouraged and say, oh, I can't meditate, I can't pray. Uh, just let them come. Just let them come. Stay with the prayer word and let the thoughts come. Uh, these distracting thoughts, he says, will be your purgatory while on earth. There's a sense there's a purification happening. Um, it's uh, the purification of patience. But we can't get to the end immediately. We can't get to this unity with God. It's a, it's a journey. And we have to be patient. And we have to be humble in the sense that we don't, uh, we aren't in charge of the, uh, when it's going to happen. We have to let go and let God guide. And this is why the, the end of the journey and the journey are united. Because the, the patience and the humility uh, and the other centeredness that these three um, bits of advice lead us to are, are the very state which we need in order to be one with God. It is uh, all those, God's nature is all that. So to sum up the, the cloud of our name, what it's trying to say um, is that God, simply, simply really, is that God is love. And that we can't get to God in any other way. And we have to learn uh, how to love. And the prayer is part of this journey of learning how to love. We learn all these things in prayer. Patience, humility, uh, taking the attention off ourselves, opening to another. All these things are learned which uh, teach us how to love in our daily lives. In this, uh, in this love. We have for God, for ourselves, and for others, uh, where we where we find uh, who we really are. So um, that's the, the the inspiration of the cloud of unknowing. And um, I hope you've enjoyed these talks. It's, uh, I've enjoyed putting them together. All the um, cartoons I've tried to make something that can seem a bit uh, serious and uh, beyond us as something a bit more approachable and a uh, sense of humor that the, the cloud author does have a sense of humor. Uh, he's um, in the same way as Julian does, this English uh, medieval sense of humor that comes, comes in through their works. Uh, so I've tried to express that. Um, if you enjoyed these talks, they are a complement to the uh, course on the roots of Christian mysticism, which are, is on the World Community for Christian Meditation webpage. That's the school of meditation aspect of the World Community for Christian Meditation. And there's a whole course there on uh, the roots of Christian mysticism. And I hope I'll be, I'll be able to give some more talks as well out of uh, that full course. So thank you very much for joining me for these ones. Bye.